This video is brought to you by an interdimensional being from mathematical realms. Unfortunately, I don't have a direct channel of communication with your dimension, so I have to use technician for that. He translates my messages into a human understandable language and makes videos out of them. And since technician is mortal, he can make mistakes. If you see such a thing, first of all, blame him, because I'm never wrong. And secondly, comment below about these mistakes. Okay. When you study complex analysis, you encounter all these different properties functions can have, like being complex differentiable, holomorphic, analytic, and conformal. And most of the times people use them interchangeably, or stick to just one, which is understandable since in the case of complex analysis, these notions are equivalent. But fundamentally in a more general sense, they all have different meanings. So this video is an overview of these notions. I'm going to talk briefly about all of them, clarify how they are related, and what's the difference between them. Here are prerequisites. This overview assumes you are familiar with multivariable real calculus, linear algebra, vector calculus, and complex numbers. So, without further ado, let's start. Before we talk about differentiability of complex functions, let me briefly remind you what this notion means for real functions. Let's start with the definition of the derivative. So, suppose f is a function from r to r. Then, to get the derivative of f at a point x equals x naught, first, we give x naught a small increment h. Then, we write down the difference between the values of f at the points x naught plus h and x naught, divided by the difference between the values in x, that is just h. And, finally, let h tend to zero. If this limit exists and it's unique, then we call it a derivative of f at the point x naught, and say that f is differentiable at this point. The idea behind the notion of differentiability is pretty simple. f is differentiable, if locally, it can be well approximated by a linear function. And, using a slightly convoluted notation, we can write this down as the following. The increment of f is equal to df of x naught and h plus alpha of x naught and h. Here, df is exactly that linear function that approximates f locally. We call it a differential of f. At a given point x naught, it takes a small increment in x as input and returns a small increment in f as output. And linearity means the following. As to alpha, it's just the term that is smaller in order than h when h tends to zero. Notice that this definition of differentiability would also work for functions from Rn to Rm. But in our one-dimensional case, linear function is just a multiplication by a real number, and this number is exactly the derivative of f at the point x naught. So, f is differentiable at x naught whenever f prime of x naught exists. Now, let's consider a complex function f defined on a domain d. In this case, we map domain d to some other domain f of d. So, let's replicate our construction. First, let's pick a point z naught inside d. Next, let's give this point a small increment h. But note that h is complex now, so the point z naught plus h could be to the left of z naught, to the right, or anywhere in its neighborhood. And our function f will map these points to f of z naught and f of z naught plus h. Now, Let's write down the difference quotient again. That is f of z naught plus h, minus f of z naught, all divided by h. And take the limit of this expression as h tends to zero. At the first glance, this doesn't look too much different from the way we defined real derivatives. But here's a catch. Firstly, since h is arbitrary, z naught plus h is not specified exactly, so it can approach z naught from any direction. Or equivalently, h can approach zero from any direction. And secondly, who said it should approach zero on a straight line? It could do that, for example, on spiral, or in any other way, as long as it converges to zero in the end. And if we look at the corresponding sequences of values of f, then there is no reason to assume that all these different sequences are going to have the same limit. It's only when we demand this limit not just to exist, but to be unique for all the possible ways h can approach zero. Only in this case, we call this limit a complex derivative of a function f at a point z naught. So, 
Complex differentiability is a much stronger notion than real differentiability. It significantly restricts the class of all possible complex functions. We will see later that even a very simple looking function may not have a derivative. For example, a function that just gives you the complex conjugate of C is not differentiable. So, if a function f has a complex derivative at a point C0, we say that a function f is complex differentiable at that point. If a function f is complex differentiable not only at C0, but also in its neighborhood, we say that f is holomorphic at C0. You might ask, why would we need different terms for such similar notions? Well, the reason is this. You can imagine functions that are differentiable only at some isolated points, and there is really nothing interesting about that. In fact, all the miracles of complex analysis come through exactly when we consider functions that are holomorphic on open sets. Now, depending on where you look, some authors make this distinction between complex differentiability and holomorphicity, and some don't. Some use just the term holomorphic, some just the term complex differentiable. It's really just a matter of taste and tradition. And one more thing. Although the concepts of real and complex differentiability differ in some ways, complex derivative is still a derivative. Meaning, its definition implies all the usual properties derivatives have, like linearity or product rule. So, for example, the derivative of c squared plus e is 2z plus 1, as you would expect. As to the notion of a differential, we can introduce it in the same way as in the real case. So, f is complex differentiable, if locally, it can be well approximated by a linear function. That is, the increment in f is equal to df of z0 in h plus alpha of z0 in h. Here, df is a differential of f, but in this case, linearity is meant in the complex sense. And just like before, a linear function is just a multiplication by a number, but this time, this number is complex, and it's exactly the derivative of f. But here is where things differ. Firstly, remember that geometrically, complex multiplication is just a composition of scaling and rotation. And secondly, since complex derivative is the same in all directions, then all the h's are scaled and rotated by the same amount. So, if real differentiability allows for arbitrary linear transformations, complex differentiability is much more restrictive. That is, locally, a holomorphic function looks like a uniform scaling plus rotation. And therefore, when acting on geometric figures, such functions preserve their shapes as well as the orientation of C if we're talking about sufficiently small neighborhoods. That's why, for example, a function that gives us a complex conjugate of C is not holomorphic. Geometrically, complex conjugation is just a reflection along the real axis, but reflection changes the orientation of the complex plane, so it can be described as a composition of scaling and rotation. Now, if a function f is holomorphic, let's investigate what are the implications of that. So, we have our argument z, which can be written down as x plus i of y. We have our f of z, which we can write down as u plus iv, where u and v are real and imaginary parts of f, and they both are functions from r2 to r. And, we have our small increment h, that's equal to h1 plus i h2. Now, let f be holomorphic on some domain d, and let's pick a point z not inside this domain. First, let h2 be zero, that is, let h approach zero along the real axis, and let's just write down the derivative of f at z naught. We have f prime of z naught is equal to limit as h1 tends to zero of f of z naught plus h1 minus f of z naught, all divided by h1. And analogous to real calculus, we can think about this limit as a partial derivative of f with respect to x, or as a derivative in the real direction. Similarly, let h1 be zero, or in other words, let h approach zero along the imaginary axis. Then, f prime of z naught is equal to limit as h2 tends to zero of the following expression. First, we take one over i out of the limit since it's a constant. And what's left 
we can think of it as a partial derivative of f with respect to y, or as a derivative in the imaginary direction. Next, let's write down f as u plus i v. Then, we obtain the following. Since f is holomorphic, these derivatives should be equal to each other. And they are equal, when their real and imaginary parts are equal. So, we obtain that du by dx equals dv by dy, and du by dy equals minus dv by dx. Or, without using u and v to express f, that's df by dy equals i times df by dx. These equations are called the cauchy riemann equations, and this is our first result that is a consequence of the property of holomorphicity. Now we are going to do something strange. Let's think about a complex function f as a function of not just one variable z, but two independent variables, x and i times y. And next, let's make a change of variables from x i y to z z bar in a way like we usually do it in real analysis. So c is x plus i y, and z bar is x minus i y, then, for x and y, we obtain the following expressions. And let's express the differentiation with respect to the new variables z and z bar, in the terms of differentiation with respect to the old variables, x and i times y. Using the chain rule, we get And for both of these expressions, we can get rid of i in the second term, since it's a constant. Next, to obtain the derivatives of x and y, with respect to z and z bar, we just look at these expressions. So, the derivative of x, with respect to z and z bar, is just one half. And for the derivative of y, we get plus and minus one half times i. And as the result, we get the following expressions for these differential operators d by dz and d by dz bar. They are often called Wurdinger derivatives. If you think there was something fishy about this derivation, you're not wrong. Because how exactly z and z bar can be independent from each other? When you fix z, e, z bar should also be fixed. So, yes, this explanation is in the category of hand-waving mass, but it gives us an intuition about what these d by dz and d by dz bar operators do. That is, they're just usual derivatives with respect to z and z bar. And now, after we apply them to holomorphic function f, we are going to discover something interesting. So let's start with df by dz bar. And, using the Cauchy Riemann equations, that is exactly zero. On the other hand, for df by dz, we have. And, again, Using the Cauchy Riemann equations, that is just df by dx, or, since f is holomorphic, it's just the derivative of f. So, if f is holomorphic, then df by dz is the derivative of f. And df by dz bar is equal to zero. Therefore, f cannot depend on z bar. To illustrate this important result, let's consider a simple example. Let f be a complex conjugation. Since df by dz bar equals one, and not zero, function f shouldn't be holomorphic. Let's verify that using the definition of a derivative. So we have limit as h tends to zero of z bar plus h bar minus z bar all divided by h. And writing h and h bar in the exponential form gives us. And we left with the exponent of minus two i theta. So the limit actually depends on the angle theta or how h is approaching zero. Therefore, f is not holomorphic, as expected. Here's a couple more examples of functions that depend on z bar, and therefore, cannot be holomorphic. And one more thing that we'll make use of later. Let's express the derivative of f using the function u. So we have. This is just direct computation. You can check it yourself. But in the end, Using the Cauchy Riemann equations, we'll get this 2 times the Wurdinger derivative of u with respect to z. Okay, let's again consider holomorphic function f from c to c. But now, let's associate with f a real function big f 
from R2 to R2, such that it maps the points with coordinates X, Y to the points with coordinates UV. Our goal is to try to find a connection between the derivatives of F and big F. Okay, on R2, consider some point P0 that have coordinates X0, Y0, and a small increment H with components H1 and H2. Then, if F is differentiable in the real sense, then we can write. Here, J is the Jacobian of F, which now plays a role of a derivative, and alpha is smaller in order than H when h approaches zero. If we write down j explicitly, it's a two by two real matrix, which elements are the partial derivatives of u and v, with respect to x and y. And, if the corresponding complex function f is holomorphic, then by applying the Cauchy-Riemann equations, we obtain. Now, let's find the determinant of j. That is just du by dx squared, plus du by dy squared. If this looks to you like a square of the absolute value of some complex number, you're not wrong. Because this is exactly du by dz, multiplied by 2. And this is just a derivative of f, as we showed previously. So, if f is holomorphic, then the corresponding real function big F has a Jacobian, the determinant of which is equal to the absolute value of the derivative of f squared. One last thing on the topic of holomorphicity. Let's consider a derivative of f along a particular direction. That is, let the argument of h be fixed when h tends to zero. So we write df by dz theta equals the following. And let's again think of f as a function of z and z bar. Then the increment of f is equal to df by dz multiplied by h plus df by dz bar multiplied by h bar all that, plus O of H. And we get the sum of these two terms, where the second term depends on theta. So the value of the derivative depends on theta, as we would expect. Geometrically, we can imagine the following picture. When theta changes between 0 and pi, the point df by dz theta traverses a circle centered at df by dz with radius df by dz bar. And, if f is holomorphic, then df by dz bar equals zero, and all directional derivatives are the same. In conclusion, if a function f is holomorphic, then it satisfies the Cauchy-Riemann equations. The derivative of f equals df by dz, and df by dz bar equals zero so f doesn't depend on z bar. Locally, f is a composition of rotation and uniform scaling. The corresponding real function f has a Jacobian of the following form, and its determinant is equal to the absolute value of the derivative of f squared. And in the next section, we're going to talk about conformal maps. Before we talk about conformal maps, let me say a few things about curves in C. A parametric curve is just a continuous map from a real interval to the complex plane. But we are going to be interested only in a specific class of curves that satisfy the following conditions. Map L should be bijective. Geometrically, that means that our curve shouldn't have any self-intersections. Map L should be differentiable and have a non-vanishing derivative Geometrically, that means a curve should be smooth and without kinks. Next, if we write down L of t as the sum of two terms, x of t and i times y of t, then, for the derivative of L, we get the following. And the differential of L is equal to L prime of t, dt, which is, of course, absolutely expected. Now, let's consider again a holomorphic function f and its real n log big F. Let's then pick a non-critical point z naught. That is a point at which the derivative is not equal to zero. This point will correspond to some point p naught on R2, at which the determinant of jf 
will be also non-zero. Then, by the implicit function theorem, we can claim that in a neighborhood of P0, function f is homeomorphic, meaning it's invertible, bijective, and continuous in both directions. And even more than that, since the Jacobian of big F has a strictly positive determinant of P0, it also preserves the orientation of R2. Now, let's go back to our complex function f, and let's consider a smooth curve L that goes through Z0. Function f will map this curve to some other curve L tilde. And for the derivative of L tilde, using the chain rule, we can write the following. Curve L is smooth. Assuming f prime is continuous, we can claim that the curve L tilde is also smooth. And let's consider more closely the derivative of f. Firstly, its absolute value is equal to the following expression. And if we multiply and divide it by dt, we obtain that it's equal to the modulus of dl tilde divided by dl. This number is just the scale factor by which L is stretched or compressed under F in a small neighborhood of Z0. But since F is holomorphic, the left side of this equation doesn't depend on a particular curve L. So we can conclude that all curves that go through Z0 are scaled by the same factor. As to the argument of F prime of C, it is equal to the following. That is just the angle by which L is rotated under F at Z0. And once again, since f is holomorphic, this angle should be the same, no matter which curve L we choose. So, all the curves that go through Z0 are rotated by the same angle. And therefore, if we have two curves, L1 and L2, intersecting at Z0, then, after the transformation, f will preserve the angle between them, as well as the orientation of the complex plane. Such transformations are called conformal. So, we've shown that in a region with no critical points, a holomorphic function f is also conformal. And what about critical points? At these points the determinant of j equals to zero, and from the course of linear algebra, we know that such transformations are degenerate, meaning j will squash a plane into a line, or a point, so the notion of the angle between curves no longer makes sense. Yet another derivation of the same geometric property comes from a matrix representation of complex numbers. Once again, let's consider holomorphic function f and a real function big F associated with it. As we showed before, a complex derivative is just a complex number, and the corresponding Jacobian of big F is a matrix of the following form. F prime of C acting on H, is just complex multiplication, which geometrically corresponds to the composition of rotation and scaling. And J, acting on a vector big H, supposedly, should represent the same geometric transformation. But how can we see it? The answer comes from a matrix representation of complex numbers. It turns out, we can construct a correspondence between complex numbers and real 2 by 2 matrices. In this picture, the addition and multiplication of complex numbers corresponds to the usual addition and multiplication of matrices. But on the other hand, as linear algebra teaches us, we can think of 2 by 2 real matrices as linear operators acting on vectors in R2. And since vectors in R2 can be also associated with complex numbers, we can think of a matrix acting on a vector as the multiplication of corresponding complex numbers. Does it sound too convoluted? Don't worry, things will become trivial if we look at examples. So, we know that 1 times z gives us just z. And matrix of what form, acting on a vector, gives us the same vector. Obviously, it's the identity matrix. We also know that i times z gives us z, rotated by 90 degrees. And matrix of what form corresponds to that? Obviously, that's just a rotation matrix of the following form. 
or in a numerical form. And as you can guess, if we square this matrix, we will get the identity matrix with a minus sign. And that's pretty much it. These two matrices form a basis from which we can construct any other matrix that corresponds to an arbitrary complex number. And if we write down Z in a trigonometric form, we can easily see why a matrix of this form is just a composition of rotation and scaling. Also, since modulus of Z squared equals dead of Z hat, and modulus of Z is non-negative, we can conclude that Z hat is orientation preserving. Consider again a holomorphic function f that's equal to u plus i v and let u and v be twice differentiable. Then, for the second derivative of u with respect to x, we can write the following. d squared of u by dx squared equals d by dx squared of dv by dy. Changing the order of differentiation and using the Cauchy-Riemann equations again, we get the following. Therefore, the Laplacian of u is equal to zero. Functions that satisfy this equation are called harmonic. And, using the same reasoning, we can conclude that V is also harmonic. So, if F is holomorphic, then its real and imaginary parts are harmonic. Therefore, all theorems on holomorphic functions are also theorems on pairs of harmonic functions. But only the pairs that satisfy the Cauchy-Riemann equations, and such pairs are called harmonic conjugate to each other. A couple of small, but important details. Firstly, although V is the harmonic conjugate of U, U is not the harmonic conjugate of V, minus U is. This comes from the asymmetry of the Cauchy-Riemann equations. And secondly, from the form of the Laplace operator, we can see that a harmonic function is determined only up to an additive constant. In many ways, harmonic functions are real analogs to holomorphic functions or vice versa, depending on how you look at it. Since Laplace's equation is one of the most fundamental and basic equations of mathematical physics, the study of harmonic functions plays a crucial role in many areas of mathematics and countless physical applications. And, one can see complex analysis as the special case of the theory of harmonic functions in dimension two. Let us list a couple of properties of harmonic functions that help us picture their connection to complex analysis. First, note that we can express the Laplace operator using Wurdinger derivatives. To prove that, we just use their definitions. By doing that, we've also proved that d by dz and d by dz bar commute with each other. Next, let's consider the gradients of u and v. If we write down their dot product, the Cauchy-Riemann equations imply that it should be zero, which means these vector fields are orthogonal to each other. And since these gradient fields correspond to level curves u equals a and v equals b, we can conclude that these level curves are also orthogonal to each other. Here is an example of how it would look like. We've talked about how holomorphicity implies harmonicity for the real and imaginary parts of a complex function. But what about the reverse procedure? How do we construct a holomorphic function from a harmonic one? Well, it turns out there is a natural way of doing that. Let big U be harmonic. Then, if we define U as d big U by dx and V as minus d big U by dy, we can easily show that a function f that is equal to u plus iv, is going to be holomorphic. One of the most emblematic properties of harmonic functions is the mean value property. Although its derivation has nothing to do with complex analysis, I've decided to include it in the video. The reasoning is very simple. Unless you've derived it yourself, it's very hard to believe that it can be true. If you really understand what it says, 
it seems too miraculous. But, feel free to skip to the next part. So, let's consider harmonic function U, on a domain D. Inside this domain, consider disk B, of radius R, centered at the point, x0, y0. Our harmonic function U, defines a vector field, nabla U, on D. And let's write down the divergence theorem for nabla U, when it flows through the disk B. That is, the flux of nabla U, through the boundary of B, is equal to the integral of divergence of nabla U over B. Here, dn is orthogonal to the boundary of B, and ds is just the area element on a plane. Since the Laplacian of U is equal to zero, the right-hand side of this equation vanishes, and we conclude that the flux of nabla U to the boundary of B is equal to zero too. Since the value of the flux doesn't depend on the coordinates, let's use the center of B as the origin of our coordinate system. Then, a vector normal to the boundary of B coincides with a unit radius vector. So, we can write the following. And since dB is just a circle, we can substitute R d theta for dL. As to the dot product of nabla U and the unit vector ER, that's just the radial coordinate of nabla U in polar coordinates. From here, we use the Leibniz integral rule, which allows us to change the order of integration and differentiation. Finally, let's take this expression and integrate it with respect to R, from zero to big R. By the fundamental theorem of calculus, that's just the difference between these two terms. The first one is the integral of u along the circle dB, and the second one is the value of u at the center of B, multiplied by 2 pi. And if we remember that all this should be equal to zero, we obtain the following. On the left-hand side, we have the value of u at some point x0, y0. And on the right-hand side, we have the average value of u on a circle centered at this point. From here, with a few extra steps, one can show that the same property must be true for holomorphic functions. Again, to get the value of f, at some point z0, we choose an arbitrary circle, centered at z0, and calculate the average value of f on this circle. But implications don't end here. I think you wouldn't be too surprised if I've told you there's nothing special about circles, and we can choose a boundary of an arbitrary compact set instead, as long as it's inside the domain where f is holomorphic. Of course, the formula would change and the integral would no longer correspond to the average value of f, but the most crucial result would still hold. That is, the values of the holomorphic function f inside a compact set are completely determined by the values of f on the boundary of this set. Same is true for harmonic functions. So, loosely speaking, harmonic and holomorphic functions are overdetermined. If such a function is defined on a compact set, all information about it is in some sense encoded on the boundary of this set. Lastly, let's talk about another result that follows from the mean value property and makes harmonic and holomorphic functions even more rigid. The maximum principle states the following. A non-constant harmonic function can have a maximum only on the boundary of the set on which it is defined. I won't give a proof here but if you want to gain an intuition why that might be the case, look at the mean value property and ask yourself a question. How can a function u at some point x0, y0 have a larger value than at every point of which it's the average? It can. Also note that since a function minus u is also harmonic, the same reasoning would imply that u can't have a minimum inside the domain d either. So, Visually, harmonic functions look something like this. They have no bumps and no dents. And if you see one, this usually means that a function have a singularity there. 
And what about holomorphic functions? Well, the statement is identical. The only difference is that we are talking about the absolute value of f now. So, a non-constant holomorphic function can have a maximum only on the boundary of the set on which it's defined. And since a function, 1 over f, is also holomorphic, the same reasoning works for a minimum too. Although we are requiring f to be non-zero in this case. Okay, in the last section, we're going to talk about analytic functions. Let's start with the real case. Real function f is said to be analytic at a point x0 if it can be expanded as a convergent power series in the neighborhood of this point. This is just the usual Taylor expansion, and the coefficients a n are derived from the derivatives of f at the point x0. Couple of words about the terminology. A function f is said to be of ck class if it's k times differentiable and all of its derivatives are continuous. So, the class C0 consists of all continuous functions, the class C1 of all continuously differentiable functions, etc. And if a function is infinitely differentiable, we say it's in the C infinity class. Obviously, these classes form a nested structure, that is, C0 contains C1, C1 contains C2, etc. As to the class of analytic functions, it's denoted by C omega. And, clearly, if a function is analytic, it is also infinitely differentiable. Or, in other words, C omega is contained in C infinity. Interestingly enough, the converse statement is not true. That is, not every infinitely differentiable function is analytic. The canonical example for this is the following function. One can show that it's infinitely differentiable at every point of R, but it's not analytic at the point x equals zero. It has the Taylor expansion at this point, but it doesn't coincide with the function there. Although this looks unusual, one shouldn't be too surprised by this fact, because what exactly the Taylor expansion does it's just the best polynomial approximation of a function in question. In many cases, this approximation works quite well, but for a large class of functions, that's just not enough. That's why, in the real case, C omega and C infinity are two different classes. Definitions from the last subsection are easily translated to the complex case. Just as before, f is analytic at z0 if it can be expanded as a convergent power series in a neighborhood of this point. The only difference now is that the coefficients a n are now complex. We also have the same definitions for different classes of functions. But here's where things start to differ. Just like before, analyticity implies infinite differentiability. But in the complex case, converse is also true meaning every infinitely differentiable function is also analytic. So, the classes C omega and C infinity coincide with each other. But even more than that, if a complex function is differentiable just once, it's differentiable infinitely many times, and, by implication, is also analytic. So, the notions of differentiability and analyticity are equivalent in the complex case. Every holomorphic function is analytic and vice versa. This statement is one of the most essential results of complex analysis. A short summary. In complex analysis, analyticity and holomorphicity are equivalent properties. And if we consider only non-critical points, then every holomorphic function is also conformal. Finally, harmonic functions are real analogs of holomorphic functions and behave in a similar way. I hope this cleared some things up for you.